Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, we're just going to wait a few moments before we get started. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from in the chat so we get to know you a little bit better. Perfect. Yeah, so as we we're coming welcome, in, everybody. Yeah, welcome. So as we're coming in, if you want to write your name and where you're coming from in the chat, that'd be great. So we can see, we get to know where everyone's coming from. Mexico, amazing. <laughs> Nice. Boston. <laughs> oh, wow. All over. Wow. Me? Waterloo. Wow. wow. I love this engaging chat here. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love when we have such a good mix of Canadian yeah. friends, American friends, somebody from Mexico. Very exciting. Amazing. Okay, so it looks like we're, let's get started. So first of all, thank you so much for joining today and taking time out of your busy schedules. I'm Stephanie Keels, Marketing Specialist. So before we get started, I just want to start today's session by acknowledging that Keels head office is located in Vancouver, which, on the, which is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Miskwiam, Squamish, and Salish Tooth First Nations, and give thanks for their generosity and hospitality on these lands and waters. If you're new to Keela, welcome. Keela is a donor management and fundraising platform that helps you deepen donor engagement, centralize your data, and raise more for your cause. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a live Q&A. So throughout this presentation, please feel free to write any questions you have in the chat box or in the Q&A section. We'll be sure to get to as many as we can by the end. So speaking of the chat box, please remember to select everyone when you type so all of our guests today can read your comments and questions. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. And, we're, and you'll receive access to the recording before the end of the week. So now with all that out of the way, I'm excited to welcome our expert speakers today, Brian Dillman, VP of Growth and Marketing at Kila, and Meredith Gray, Head of Marketing at Kila. So without further ado, I will pass it to you both. Thanks, Steph. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're really excited to have everybody take a little bit of time out of their day today to come and join Bryna and I and learn a little bit about Email Marketing 101 for nonprofits. So before we get into it, um, Stephanie mentioned that Bryna and I are both from Kila, um, but Bryna and I are also fundraisers. So I myself spent about 10 years in the nonprofit sector, uh, working mostly in peer-to-peer -peer and in sponsorship, uh, but I've also kind of dipped my toes into diversifying revenue streams, building fundraising pipelines, um, and all of those good, important things that come along with being a fundraiser. Hello, welcome. And thank you, Stephanie and Meredith, and thank you all for letting us know where you're from. I too am from the nonprofit sector with over 17 years of experience working in a variety of fundraising and strategy and database roles. And I'm just so excited to learn from all of you, share our experiences, and hopefully give you some takeaways to help you build those incredible, powerful communications, especially in these days where technology is, you know, our partner and how we're really going to make a difference and raise those funds. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so eight seconds. That is the average attention span for an adult reading an email that you may send them. That's not a lot. <laughs> that is a very, very short attention span. It does actually compare to the attention span of a goldfish. So I can guarantee that the email that you're planning to send or the email that you're thinking about sending is going to take you a lot longer than eight seconds to create. Uh, if I were to guess, it's probably going to take you at least an hour, if not two hours or more to create. So if it's going to take you hours to create an email, but you know that people are only going to be spending about eight seconds reading it, why should you even care? What makes this worth your time? It's because email marketing is still one of the most effective ways to connect with your community and raise money for your mission. On top of that, email marketing still generates the best return on investment or ROI uh, for your marketing and fundraising dollars. So according to industry stats, you'll earn approximately $36 for every $1 that you spend on email marketing. 
that's a pretty good ROI. So email marketing, it's cost effective, it's efficient, and it can be frequently done in-house, making that return on investment very, very good. And as a nonprofit, you're already ahead of the game when you compare email marketing to other industries. Nonprofit emails are actually four times more likely to be opened and their click-through rate is 25% compared to say a social media post on Facebook, uh, which sits around 7%. So in this webinar, uh, we're gonna run through the most common type of email campaign, which is your fundraising appeal. We're gonna teach you some best practices on how to quickly and effectively capture a reader's interest uh, and teach you how to automate some of these campaigns to make sure that it's you know maybe the best eight seconds of their lives if that's all they're gonna spend on it. Okay, so. I'm going to launch a poll because right now I would love to ask everybody two questions. The first is I want to know if you have sent a fundraising appeal recently. So if you can all take a look at the poll, say yes and no. And the second question I'd love you to all answer is, were you happy with the results? You can choose yes, no or maybe you're unsure of the results and that's okay too. So we'll give everybody a minute or two. Were you happy with the results if you did in fact lead a fundraising campaign? And we're gonna go into some reasons of why this is important. So this is interesting because we've got most people saying no, they didn't send a fundraising appeal in the near future, which is good. This is email marketing 101. So if you haven't sent one recently, that's okay. Uh, but of the most people who have sent them, most people weren't happy with the results from it. So you're all in the right place. We're excited <laughs> to kind of dive into it. Okay, perfect. And money guess if you did not have one, NA. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so how do you create a fundraising appeal email does anybody want to even put some information in the chat call it out any ideas if not i'm going to keep talking but share your ideas there are over hundreds of people on this call and we'd love for you to all interact as much as possible as well okay so right we're all here today to learn how to create that fundraising appeal. And we're gonna teach you on how to create not just a fundraising appeal, but a great one. We're gonna take you through eight tips. That's right, eight. Feel free to write it down, pay attention to the slides. Otherwise we'll send this to you all afterwards. And we're gonna make you understand how to do this easy, effective, and even something that you look forward to sending next time. Okay, so let's get into it. Tip number one, it's called segmentation. Thank you. Yes, subject line, subject line. A lot of people love it. Emotional response, awesome. First tip is segmentation. So before you dive into sending your email, you're gonna to wanna to figure out who are you sending it to? Storytelling, love it, Emily. Thanks everyone for sharing. Well, when you have storytelling and when you have a great subject line, you wanna even break it down even further. That's why we are calling segmentation first because really the benefit of, it, of segmentation really allows you to group contacts into lists depending on shared demographics or behavior. And from a fundraising perspective, you can create a donor lapsed list. Now understanding lapsed is very different between organizations. Some people consider lapsed after no, somebody not donating after six months, three years, it all depends on you. You get to choose these segmentation lists, but you create a list and an email specific to those contacts to re-engage them. And you only want to target those individuals, potentially people who have lapsed and ask them to upgrade or re-engage with you to gain their donations. And actually the last one just happened to me. So I don't know a lot of you, but really, really love the Humane Society and any animals. And I donate to them international, the Humane Society International on a monthly basis. They actually just sent me an email last month and it was based on the specific programs that I've showcased to them that I'm interested in. So it actually asked me and said, if I increase my donations by only $5 extra dollars a month, I could save 30 more puppies from dog meat farms. Well, it worked. 
five extra dollars. They obviously knew my range. They weren't going to ask me for an extra $20 a month. They weren't going to ask me to do another event or program considering I only do monthly events or I only contribute monthly and it worked. I upped my donation by five by $5. I'm happy. They're happy. The puppies are happy and everybody wins in this situation. But the only reason that it worked was because I was flagged and segmented as a monthly donor, whereas I would have been I would have potentially completely disregarded the email if I had only gone to their events or I had only volunteered. So you really want to segment people and your donors and your volunteers and your individuals in your pipeline based on interactions that they have. It's really using segments, you can send hyper personalized messages to the audience that it's most relevant to. Plus, segmentation can actually have an incredible impact. Take a look at these numbers. I know you can all, you know, read the screen, but what I want to focus on is 760%. Okay, that's a large number. What does that mean? 760% increase in email revenue from personalized and segmented email campaigns. People want to hear from you. People want to be talked to, but they don't want to be a number in your database. They want to know that you've heard them, that you've heard them and listened to how they're behaving and interacting with your organization. It's important that if they're going to give you info, that you use that info to talk back to them and to communicate with them. Okay, so how do you segment your list? Does anybody know? And Emily, we can answer that question in a bit, but absolutely, how do you segment your list? Okay, throw it out there. Do you pull a list and put it on a spreadsheet? Do you pick out people? What, what, what do you do? How do you segment your list? You can start by breaking your contact list into these similar groups based on similarities or shared characteristics. And this could be anything from demographics, age, level of engagement, whatever you all feel is right for your organization. So for example, you can create a segment on program interest where certain donors may only be interested again in specific programs you run. That's just like me and Humane Society. Or you could segment best based on level of engagement. So what do you mean by that? So is this a donor that's recurring? Is this a first time donor as a lapsed donor, as we mentioned? And each one of those segments will have a bit of a different type of communication. You can also segment based on your donation methods. So does this person prefer to pay by check or by credit card, by Bitcoin? Again, all of this information works in tandem to create really specific email communications that you can use to reach out directly to your donors and segment appropriately. But just remember, your database is unique. So there could be other types of groupings where you can find and you can create tailored segments specifically for your donors and supporters. And we have three common segments that Kila customers use. And I just wanted to show you an example of how you can personalize based on your database, which is really interesting. So this does include lifetime donation value. So this segment you see is used based off of our contact insights. So almost like intelligence, reading off of all of the information that you have in your database. And it shows whether or not a donor is one of your major contributors or if they have just started out or they need a little bit of extra love. You can also segment donations by campaigns or impact area. Do you need to support you know, dogs or cats or is there a specific type of campaign your organization does? that allows you to analyze which specific area in your organization supporters are contributed, contributing to. It does say a lot about the connection they feel to the way you're doing. So if you're an environmental company and you're always asking for funds to support services and you never get a large amount of donations and you switch it and you ask them to contribute to a different impact area, which might be awareness or lobbying, you might find larger individuals being um, swayed towards those. Uh, areas. Again, you get to choose and decide and see where and how your audience is moving and interacting, and you can really utilize that information for further campaigns. And again, with Kila, one of our most popular options is that we have recurring donor segmentation, and this provides a list of donors who have given a couple of one-off gifts over the course of the year. So maybe someone's given at an event, maybe someone's given at a different type of campaign, but what Kila does, which is really helpful for individuals in these days and times, is that it might be a good fit to try and communicate to these individuals to see if they're 
if they'd like to be a regular recurring giver. A lot of times people don't even realize that they're giving a couple times a year and maybe they, they're, they don't even know that the opportunity to give monthly is an option. So using your database to be able to really see these kinds of insights is a huge opportunity for you. And tip number two is next. So tip number two is write a really good subject line. So I saw a few of you mention subject lines. Um, none of the other steps that we're going to talk about today really matter if you can't get anybody to open your email. So the shortest piece of content in your whole email is likely where you will spend a good amount of your time trying to figure out that exact combination of urgency, of mystery, of allure, of whatever you need to do to get people to just click on your email and open it. And there's a good reason for that. 35% of email recipients open emails based on the subject line alone. 35%. So here are uh, some best practices for writing some effective subject lines. So the first one is that you want to make it descriptive. Be clear about what people are going to find inside of your email, but balance that with making it interesting. So something that sounds too spammy can actually turn people off entirely. Uh, and building on that kind of 35% of people who open emails based on the subject line, 69% of email recipients report emails as spam just based on the subject line. So in this case, you really want to be careful with your word choice. So you can see in our example here, we've made it clear that there's going to be an ask to join the cause in some capacity. Um, but that has been left a bit vague to keep readers wondering what you might be up to. And it also references the mission of your organization, which in this case would be related to heart health. So for your subject line, we also recommend avoiding things like all caps, symbols, but you can use emojis, but steer clear of some symbols um, and steer clear of words like free or buy or those kinds of things that are you know, typically automatically red flags for spam filters and will likely not even reach the inbox of the audience that you're trying to get to. So the next thing that you want to do is keep it on the shorter side. Shorter subject lines typically perform better. So try to aim for about 60 characters or less. And that's because more and more people are opening their emails on their phones, which means that you need shorter subject lines. Otherwise, it's just cut off uh, and they'll just see kind of all the little dots and they'll probably just delete it right away. So all of that work that you put into crafting your perfect subject line will have gone out the window if it's too long. So the third is that you wanna make it urgent. You want to encourage your audience to act right away. So using urgent language gives your readers a chance to take part in something that's only available for a limited time. So using words like act now, donate today, last chance, urgent help needed, makes them feel like they have the ability to save the day just by opening your email. And tip three, a lot of individuals uh, were saying this on the call, so I appreciate that, is embrace storytelling. You all have stories, and not only do you as an organization have stories, but the people that you support or the animals or the services, whatever you do, there's stories to be told. So remember, people donate to your organization and get involved because they want to be part of your mission. And the first place to start is to leverage the power of your nonprofit story. So let's give you some tips. When you're writing your email, I want you all to think what drives your organization? What makes your impact valuable? Why should people care about the work that you are doing? And again, this has to go back to your mission statement. You want to keep these questions in mind and recycle that language into your communication so you can spark the interest of both your recurring and your new donors. So I have some ideas on how you can all incorporate storytelling into your emails. If you wanna even shout out some at the end, we can read a bunch of this as well, but you know, learn from each other as well as from Meredith and I. But the first one is to tell the story of the people or animals that you are helping. Remember, use their names if they give you permission because it helps build a direct link between your donors and the community that you serve. The second is share firsthand, firsthand accounts from your staff. Yes, all of you, I bet all of you on here have a reason 
of why you're working there, or if you don't have a reason why you started working there, why you continue to stay and put all of the time and energy I know all of you are putting into working at your organization, especially during this time. You know, this is an unutil underutilized wellspring of stories because who sees your impact better than the people that are on the ground? And if you lean into your staff's experience and exp expertise, you'll give people an interesting behind the scenes perspective. And this can go a long way in building that transparency and building relationships. And the third one, it's a bit more fun and exciting, I guess, is listing exciting or interesting facts about your organization. People are naturally curious. Maybe they want to know more about you. So anytime you can give them a little bit of context when it was started, you know, the first person who started it might have been a volunteer and is now the CEO or people, you know, who started out, you know, calling and fundraising are actually now your biggest donor. Lots of little behind the scenes uh, tidbits and facts can really get people interested and engaged and maybe want to look out for your messages and your emails to learn more. Make it a quiz, a trivia. You really want to really engage your audience. And I know some of you might be on here with very, you know, serious subject matters that you're supporting, you know, health concerns and issues, but we're not saying to take those and make it light. What we're trying to do is engage the audience that wants to know how and why their hard earned dollars should go to you and why and how they should be opening your emails. And there's always an opportunity to use that opportunity with some of the tips and tricks that we're giving you to be able to do that. Okay, so I want to, you to take a look at this example that you see on the screen. It's from the British Red Cross, and they did a really great job of telling the story of Mobina and her family. And this is how you can kind of tug on people's heartstrings. They detail exactly what she went through. It's unfortunate, but they want to know why they should be giving to you. It includes a high quality image of her. They make the story relatable to the average reader, and they show exactly how your donation can help Mobina and others like her. And that's a typical and very effective fundraising appeal using that story or a narrative that we have been talking about. Okay, tip number four is to focus on donor impact. So donors give when they know the value of their gift. So to communicate this impact, you need to clearly show them how you will be using their donation should you receive it. So what will a donation accomplish? So if you're fundraising for, a Brian, I used an environmental organization earlier, we can use that again. This could be something like a $20 donation helps plant 25 trees in the Amazon forest or something along those lines. And you know, while this is probably an oversimplified statement and only covers a very small portion of, a work being, of the work being done by an organization like that, it's emotionally powerful, it's easy to communicate via email, and it's really digestible for your audience to understand what their gift will accomplish. Um, so you want your impact message to be simple, digestible, and impactful. And here are a few examples from around the nonprofit sector. So Charity Water, um, an example from them is your $80 monthly donation can give 24 people clean water every year. Simple digestible, impactful. Remember those three things when you're thinking about donor impact. Uh, another important thing to remember, this is not about you or your organization. As much as you know, it is you asking for a donation in a fundraising appeal or soliciting a volunteer, if that's the purpose of your email, um, whatever it may be, it's not about you or your organization. So for example, you wouldn't want to say, this month we raised $500 and we were able to feed many hungry children. That's not what you, how you wanna go about it. What you'd wanna say instead is your donation of $50 helped to feed five children who would have otherwise gone hungry. And it's thanks to donors like you that food is reaching tables of families in need. So the same message, very different delivery and a very different impact. Simple, digestible, and impactful were the three. I see somebody asking for them again. Those are the three things to keep in mind. Okay, tip number five. Include a call to action. A call to action doesn't always mean donate. 
but you absolutely need to make sure that you have a call to action. And you'd be surprised at how many emails that I get that have either none or conflicting calls to action. Visit our website, talk to me, ask for more information, volunteer. That message is confusing because me as an individual, I don't have all of these opportunities to, you know, want to do it from one email. I want to know if you're emailing me, what do you want? Do you want to tell me something and to read more? Do you want, what do you need me to do as I open this email? So you want to think of it. You went through all that trouble of figuring out who your audience is. You went through all that trouble of nailing that perfect, amazing subject line that they're actually opening your email. And you want to create your most compelling fundraising offer only to have your donors be confused about what they're supposed to do next. So your call to action should send the donors directly to your donation page, or you should ask them to sign up for volunteering. It should be one call to action. Even if you ask for that call to action multiple times within that message, as long as it's one call to action, you want to really not create any friction points by making people click through to multiple pages. With every extra step, you give your donors a chance to potentially walk away. And now I have some best practices on creating your next call to action. Make a clear ask. And they include, don't tiptoe around the fact that you're asking for a donation. You need to make it simple for your readers. So if you are an organization that needs to raise money in order to shelter more animals, you don't want to say, we're an organization, we've been around for 50 years, we have a, like, if you want to donate to our organization as a whole, if you want to become a monthly donor, you want to say, we need more money to raise housing to support the dogs that are coming into our shelter, or whatever it might be. The simple, digestible, and impactful. Thank you, Meredith. But most importantly, clear. You also want to make it visible. No one wants to be an aggressive salesperson, but in this case, you want it to be your call to action to be impossible to miss. Loud, big. When you open an email, sometimes we know from what Meredith said at the beginning, eight seconds people have to look at your message and stay or go. Within that eight seconds, if they can focus on something that's big and impactful, like a big button. Again, using technology like Kila to have easily drag and drop buttons that showcase big impact, it's going to help you have everybody who's opening it look at that big button. They might not even need to read the rest if it's need your help like now to donate. Whatever it might be, clear, simple, digestible, actionable. And the third is try getting creative. Now, we don't want you to just bold it or, you know, put it in yellow highlights, but you want to see which message best captivates your audience. Is it a picture? Is it a video? Is it a button? You can really decide what and how the creative aspects uh, are that resonate with your audience. Also, you can test it. If you have a list of a hundred people, Send it to 50 of them with a big picture and send to the other 50 with a video. Do people resonate better with videos or pictures? Try as much as you can to learn about your audience. Don't assume and don't guess. Donors will tell you when they're interested and not, and you want to, again, lean, use that information they're giving you to interact with them better. Okay, tip six. So tip number six is to get personal. This goes hand in hand with tip number one. I think that was segmentation. So we know it's much easier to develop a relationship with somebody in person, but that doesn't mean that you can't also use your email as a way to strengthen your relationship. Uh, especially since a lot of people these days prefer to be communicated with over email. Your millennials, your Gen Z donors, there. I mean, I'm a millennial. When my phone rings, I get stressed about it. So these email is going to become even more prominent as you're getting more and more of those younger donors in your in your database. Uh, but here are a few techniques that you can apply to make your virtual relationship feel a lot more personal. So the biggest tip here is that you're going to want to send your email from a person rather than a generic address. So if I was sending a fundraising appeal myself, I would send it from 
my email address over a marketing email, or at the very least, I would have, you know, my name as the sender rather than, you know, the heart and stroke team or, or whatever it may be. I would have my name and then the reply email address could be more generic if you needed to go that route. Uh, doing this lets people know that there is a real person on the other end of that email. It doesn't necessarily have to be you, um, but at one of the organizations I worked for in the past, we used to see huge spikes in our email open rates when we would send emails with the CEO as the sender, or even a member of the community who was sharing their story. So the sender should always be a name. So like I said, I mean, if you're sending an email with the CEO as the name, you probably don't want the CEO's reply email address. Um, so that's where you can just plug in a more generic one. And one of the best ways to personalize your email is to actually let your email marketing platform do it for you if you are using an email marketing platform. Uh, Keela has something called smart codes, or sometimes they're called merge tags if you're using a, a system such as MailChimp. Um, and these placeholders that get, they're, they're placeholders that get replaced by personalized information. So for example, if you use a first name smart code in your email draft, it'll say, hi, first name. And then once you send it, it will comb your database and pull in the first name of each contact so that the email would then read, hi, Bryna, or hi, Meredith, or hi, Stephanie, um, by the time that that person opens it. So it adds that little extra touch of personalization with no extra time really in it for you because it's automatically pulling it from the contact records in your database. So for Keela users on the call today, any information that your contacts provide via our donation forms or any other Keela form that you're using, um, you can take that and use it as a smart code. So name, organization, title, campaign information, anything that like that you can use to send those highly personalized emails. And while it can be a little creepy if you try to personalize everything in your emails, I wouldn't recommend personalizing everything um, unless you're sending like a one-to-one -one email, but using those smart codes can actually increase your click rates by up to 41%. Um, it can increase your open rates because you can actually pull the person's name into the subject line if you want. Uh, and it can generate donation amounts up to six times higher than not using them. So. Sometimes it pays to be uh, just a little bit creepy. Um, however, with all good things, I am gonna leave you with a word of caution. Smart codes are awesome if your database has been maintained. So your database doesn't have to be perfect because perfect data doesn't exist. Brian and I have worked at a lot of different organizations between the two of us. Neither of us have worked somewhere that has perfect data. Um, so with smart codes, there is often a fallback. And so if you're missing the information, um, so for example, if you're using first name, you can change it to say, hi there, instead of hi, Bryna, it'll have a fallback. So if you're missing the name, um, you can use that, but it's just important to keep in mind the state of your data before you start using smart codes so that your emails make sense. Um, yeah, how do you put their name in the subject line? Brina said we're happy to, to chat, but you can use smart codes in subject lines as well. That will pull that information in. Okay, tip seven, almost there. Again, just highlighting how to keep it simple. It might surprise you actually that the most impactful fundraising emails are not necessarily the most beautiful ones. So let me explain. In a series of tests, Next After showed that the removal of graphic elements on a fundraising email actually led to a 145.5% increase in donations. So why? Because a simple email sometimes actually looks more personal. So while we said play with videos, play with images, test nothing as well and see how that resonates with your particular audience. Because sometimes if you think about it, heavily branded emails looks like a marketing tool, looks like technology, looks like there was no person behind that message. There was no story. And it kind of looks like a sales pitch. Whereas a personalized email may feel as though Anita from Save the Whales sat down and typed out an email directly to you on the other side of that computer opening that message. The psychology behind it is more plain. Your email, the longer it took somebody to write it. Now, if you've ever sat down to design an email, you may know that this is 100% not the case. 
but it's the sentiment that really counts. And I'd love to hear from all of you if that works, if what we're saying resonates. You know, someone taking the time out of their day to send you a message versus receiving a marketing email that was probably sent to a thousand other people on a generic email list using smart codes we just talked about. It doesn't mean you should eliminate all images and creatives from your email. But we know branding is important for building trust, but it's best to keep it, again, as simple as possible when it comes to your fundraising appeals. You want to keep the focus on building the relationships with those donors in order to convey that story and ultimately ask for a donation. And now, as always, each donor database is different. And honestly, each and every one of you will have different segments within your database. It will be different, but what we're saying is it's your job to try and find out what your audience likes, what messaging resonates with your audience, and what communication format they prefer. So you can do this again, we said through testing. Use test emails, use an email for 50 people with no images versus 50 people with images. Video, no video, template versus no template, Honestly, you can determine how and what your audience likes. And I, as a donor, and I'm assuming a lot of you who work here also are donors, you want to know that people are talking to you. And if I love those emails that have big pictures and videos and look like branded messages, then those are then you should send me those messages. But if Meredith is opposite, you need to test and find out. And again, it's a lot of testing, which is why you wanna have the right technology to be able to test at scale so that you can create these messages and so you're not wasting all your time doing all these testing in individual capacities because we all know how stretched all of you are. We've worked in the nonprofit sector and we know you're wearing multiple hats and responsible for so much and that's why we hope that these tips and tools kind of help you. Okay, tip number eight, and then we're gonna talk quickly about metrics, um, but you will know what worked and what didn't work because of this tip. This is where you're tracking your results. So this is where it all comes together. Tips one through seven are important, but the real indicator of success is in your metrics. So you can tell a good email campaign from a bad email campaign by both comparing it against your previous emails that you've sent, if you have sent emails before, as well as against industry benchmarks, if you are kind of sending emails for the first time or you wanna see how you're sizing up compared to the industry. So for example, on average fundraising email, emails result in a 28.59% open rate and a 3.29% click-through rate. Uh, if your fundraising email open rates fall below these percentages or you click the rates fall below these percentages, you may want to reconsider your current strategy. If your results are exceeding these benchmarks, you're doing an amazing job. Keep, keep doing it. Now in Kila, you actually have the choice on how to benchmark yourself. So you can benchmark yourself against the nonprofit sector as a whole by pulling in that nonprofit sector data or you can become a little bit more granular and choose your specific area that you want to measure. So you can also benchmark yourself against yourself if you really wanted to see how you've improved year over year or in whatever time frame you choose. Uh, and Kila will let you kind of decide how you want to measure your organization. So based on what campaigns you're sending, what time of year you're sending them, and what your organization's goals are. Okay, so now that we've chosen how we want to benchmark ourselves, let's go over four key email marketing metrics to track your fundraising campaign success. So the first one is open rate. This is the percentage of email recipients who open your email, helping you understand whether or not your email recipients actually know you and trust you. So if you're sending them content they want and whether they think your emails are worth reading, in the first place. High open rates actually typically correlate with compelling subject lines, remember tip number two. But if you notice you have low open rates, it means you need to focus a little bit more on writing the hook, I guess you would say, of your email to make sure that it stands out in an inbox. So if your open rates are far below average, reconsider your list. And that's because completely unengaged stakeholders not are not who you maybe wanna spend your time on, at least not via email. 
ask them if they want to stay on your list. And if you list, if you get no response, remove them and start working with your most engaged contacts. You don't want to be testing on people who never open your message, who have not donated in a long time. You want to spend time supporting and talking to those that actually are engaged. You want to have a realistic understanding of your actual open and click-through rates. And you're going to have a well-defined list of people who may support your cause, which really will help you de develop those deeper relationships with those who are actually engaged. And we also want to emphasize open rates are not only one piece. It's not just one piece of the puzzle. You will want to start relying on other metrics to start assessing your campaign performance. Okay, the second piece of the puzzle is your click-through rate or your CTR. So this is the number of contacts who opened your email and then clicked on your call to action. So it's also sometimes called your engagement rate, but it shows how effective the content within your emails is, as well as the level of interest in your campaign or in your organization, whatever the email that you're sending might be about. If your click rates fall below the industry benchmark, it's time to consider switching something up. So start by looking at emails that have performed well in the past, if you have that kind of bank of, of emails that you sent. Those are where you can determine you know, what content did you use? Look at the ones that are successful. Was the content special? Why did it resonate? How did you direct the reader's attention through the email? Was your CTA more effective than maybe an email that you just sent? And by analyzing those emails and figuring out what worked, um, you can take that and really incorporate it into your emails going forward. If you don't have that, uh, we would I would almost suggest like sign up for other nonprofit mailing lists. You know, you'll get some really great insights into what others in the sector are sending just by joining those mailing lists and seeing how they've laid out the email. Are they using the graphics that Brian had talked about? What are their CTAs like? Are they using contrasting colors? All of these things kind of play into whether or not somebody clicks on your email. Okay, conversion rate. So your third metric is conversion rate. So this is actually the percentage of recipients who opened your email, clicked on a link within the email, and also completed your desired action. So this, in this case, it would be making a donation. This gives you a big picture assessment of your email's engagement performance and is especially useful for strategic planning because you know that your conversion rate is consistently 1.7, which by the way, happens to be the nonprofit average. So you can predict the expected results of your next campaign. Don't ever expect 100%. That's just... I mean, if you do, I would love to connect with you and discuss, but it's very unlikely to get 100% open rate, click-through rate, and conversion rate. You have people at different times in their lives, and this is why the more you segment, you can actually beat those averages because you're talking to the people who have the means and the ability and the need and the want to convert to actually do the action that you're asking. So this is, again, where tips four through six really come into play. Is your fundraising offer appealing? If your call to action is attention grabbing and your email hits a personal note with the reader, you're likely going to have a good conversion rate. But if you fall below what you expect or what your previous benchmarks have been, you need to look a little bit deeper into the tips that we mentioned. And there's a lot of fun experiments. Again, you can run in email marketing. So you should follow us at Kila because we do a lot of tips, tools, documents, e-guides, blogs, posts, et cetera on how we practice some of these efforts that we're speaking about. And if we don't, message me or Meredith or both of us, um, because relying on a community of marketers to make each other better sounds good, right? Hopefully. Okay, the last metric that we're gonna cover is bounce rate. So this metric is the percentage of emails that don't get delivered to an inbox. Um, and they can actually be categorized into two types. So there's a hard bounce, which happens when an email has failed to deliver altogether. The reasons for this could be an invalid email address was provided to you, or you've been blocked by that sender altogether. Or a soft bounce, which is caused usually by a temporary delivery issue, like a full mailbox or an offline server, something that is, you know, completely out of your control. 
And whatever the reason is that your email may have bounced, it's good to monitor your bounce rate so that you can keep a close eye on the health of your mailing list. And if your bounce rate is high, it's time to investigate why. So we're going to kind of leave you off there with that tip and, and most, or sorry, with this tip here. So most email marketing platforms will charge per email volume. That is the amount of emails that you send. But the higher your bounce rate, the more you're actually paying for emails that aren't even making it to the inboxes of the people that you're trying to send. So we would recommend if you are looking for an email platform or something like that, Kila does not charge for email volume. We charge based on how many contacts in your database, which is, you know, a good incentive, again, to keep that clean. And, and you should be considering all of your options if you're looking for an email platform. Okay, one last thing we really want to talk to you about. We know we've given you a ton of information, but we really believe we want to touch on automation because it's a huge part of email marketing. So if you want to take full advantage of your email marketing campaigns, you need to explore what does automation even mean? Automation is another word for email journeys or drip campaigns or emails where you create it and set it. And depending on the action or trigger that your donors or volunteers or stakeholders have, it will create and trigger those series of emails to engage your audience. So you really don't have to worry about it and you know they're being engaged and spoken to and connected with. It is also automations becoming more and more prominent for donor journeys. So again, you can build different donor journeys based on different criteria. So let me give you some examples. You could set up a welcome journey every time a donor gives to you for the first time, with the first one being a thank you, the second one where the money is going, and a third one about other programs and events that they're doing. So again, not all in the same day, maybe not all in the same week, but an opportunity to write all those emails today and know that that donor isn't just going to get a thank you and then not talk to you again for a while. You can set up donor journeys for anything. You can create one every time they make a gift over a certain amount of days. You can create one every time they register to an event. You can create one and include stories from your community within those donor journey emails. You can actually end up with the last email being a subscribe to our newsletter. You could ask to any kind of opportunity to engage these individuals. It's something that you can set it up and rest assured that your donors are hearing from you without too much manual work, except for the beginning by setting up those messages. And automated welcome journeys also have been proven to increase donor retention up to 13%. So they're definitely something to look into. Again, something that Meredith and I talk a lot about automation and welcome journeys on a variety of different webinars, emails. So please message us as much as you uh, would like to set up some calls with one-on-one -on -one demos or group live demos if you don't want a one-on-one -on -one experience. And we can walk you through all of these and how to really engage your audience. You're doing I want before we um, move on to the, the q and I just want to look at so Amber asked a question there does a welcome journey comply with Canada's privacy laws. It complies if the person that you're sending the email to is given consent so anytime you know you're asking them to fill out their information on a form, you should have that checkbox asking them to opt in to your communications. Um, technically, yes, it would if they have given that consent. So I would always recommend, and I know we have a mix of people from Canada and the US and in Mexico on the call today, to look into the, the regulations for your country and your province or your state, because uh, they do differ. But here in Canada, nonprofits actually have quite a few kind of permissions and, and liberties with sending emails that the for-profit sector doesn't have. So definitely look into it before you before you kind of dive in and just start mass sending emails. But that's it. I think we're going to jump into some q and I've seen some good stuff coming in. Amazing, guys. Um, yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. But if you have any more questions, please ask them in the Q&A or the chat bot, uh, box. Um, so our first question we got was from Emily. Do you send different versions of the same email to different lists or do you consider segmentation selecting a specific list for email or both? <laughs> hey, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I would say there really is no limitations with segmentation and personalization. You can 
segment in whatever way you want. If you are new to segmentation, um, I would say start with, you know, a similar email and try tweaking it slightly based on your segment. So, you know, if you if you want to send the same email about an update to a program that your team is working on, um, maybe then you are segmenting by your major donors and your monthly donors. And then in that case, you would want to personalize maybe a section of it that just says, because you're a monthly donor, you've accomplished this, or because you are a valued donor, instead of saying a major donor, um, you've accomplished this, right? So if you're if you're starting it for the first time, start with that and just see how it goes. And then as you see what is successful, you'll be able to build out those segments and have more confidence trying kind of all different things for different segments. So if there's some Q&A in the Q&A yeah. as well. I yeah, so I was actually gonna go right into the next question, but about segmentation as well. We got from Kelly. What tips do you can? Uh, what tips do you have for segmentation when you're just beginning to build your list and you don't have an established, you don't have established data yet? If you don't have data, I would start before you even start to segment. I would send a survey. So think about what segments you want to create because you can't really segment if you don't have enough data to segment on. Um, so I would literally put together a survey based on what kind of segments you think you might want and send it out. And then start to collect that information and see how you can build the segments. That's where I would start. I don't know, Brian, if you start somewhere else. No, I think you could also, by the, the smallest bit of detail, Kelly, you can ask, you're in this state, you're in this province, you're in this city, if you've collected that information, how did you hear about us? Why are you participating with us? Ask them a question, exactly what Meredith said, but say, thanks so much for supporting us in the city of Michigan or the, the the region of Michigan or Toronto, you can really segment in any way to start the conversation so that you can actually go from there. Amazing. So another question we got was about open rates and click-through rates. I know you guys already, already dove deep into this, but this person asked, they have an open rate around 47%, but their click-through rate is a little bit lower. Do you know why this could be, or do you have any tips to help them improve their overall click-through rate? Mm. So if your open rate is 47%, your subject line is killing it. Whatever subject lines you're working are great. Where I think probably the challenge is, is either the length of your email. So I would look at that. It is potentially that your email is just too long and nobody wants to read it. Remember the eight seconds that we talked about, you got to get them from the start. Um, I would look at maybe the layout of your email, your call to action might be too low. Um, and then I would look at your call to action altogether. So call to action should really be, you know, no longer than three to five words. Um, and they should be very clear and very succinct. So I would kind of start with looking at those things. And then I would test, like we mentioned, testing, testing, testing send out A-B tests of each email with two different CTAs, with different layouts, however you want to test, um, and then apply those learnings going forward, and you should probably see your, your CTR start to climb. Amazing. So um, we have another question here from Sharon. Uh, what is a good first email? We're doing a first reach out for a capital campaign, uh, and we have never fundraised before. So this is a very first, like maybe welcome email as well. <laughs> yeah, Brian, do you want to take this one? I think it's similar to what Meredith said. You know, why are you interested in our organization? And this might help you, especially if it's your first opportunity to segment based on why they're interested. They're interested in supporting, you know, a building. They're interested in supporting the cause. They're interested because they have a con direct connection to what you're supporting. All of these things will help you segment better. So I would highly suggest getting the information you want for them, uh, thanking them, and then you can start to ask for information and you can ask for donations. And we have another question here that came in um, from Amber. So what is the number of mistake you see organizations make in email marketing? Oh, good question. <laughs> I would say, I mean, and Brenna, you may have a different one, but in the emails that I get, they're very long, very long. And I know sometimes we tend to think that 
we want to share the story and we want to make it impactful and we want to really craft something that is beautifully worded and, and resonates with everybody and those are all important but you can do that in shorter emails um i would recommend and if anybody's interested in learning more about this brian and i actually did a webinar on ai and fundraising but there are um platforms right now if any of you are using like chat gpt where you can literally write if you already have an email written you can put it in copy and paste into chat gpt and say shorten this and it can condense it for you so that it's still really impactful. Or if you can use that for a first draft and give it a word count limit, like those are, um, there's a lot of tools out there that can really help you kind of make your emails succinct and to the point. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, I believe this question was already asked in the chat, but I kind of wanted to bring it back up again. Does Keel have industry benchmarks loaded already in the system for emails? Not sure for emails, but we definitely have industry benchmarks built within the platform. So if you'd like more information on Kila and the capabilities, we have group demos. So group live demos, if you're not uh, looking for that one on one experience, but definitely want to learn more about what Kila has. Absolutely. Let us know, send us a message and uh, Stephanie will send a link to our, our next live demo. We can give you more info, but yes, we have benchmark info in there. And Kelly's and asking also, great questions. Yeah. yeah. I was about yeah, to I'm, yeah. <laughs> sorry, we're also excited to answer the questions. I'm also seeing a couple of people asking about the AI webinar that I um, just referenced. It's available on our website. So if you want to go and find it, it can be viewed on demand and you can access it there. Or we can maybe include it in our follow-up message as well. Yes, we can absolutely include it in the follow-up email too. Perfect. So uh, Kelsey just asked uh, about how long should an email be and like the average word count you guys suggest? Again, it really depends on the, the segmentation. So if you are segmenting based on thanking them for event, short and sweet, you know, less than a hundred characters. If you're talking about why and how uh, this individual or animal or person or service has been, you know, impactful, you might want a little bit more. So you, again, you got to play around with it. There's not a set number. You just have to make sure that when somebody opens it, you've got the compelling subject line, clear call to action, and that there's one big kind of what do I do call to action to get them to go to the next step. Um, yeah. So we, yeah, that, 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 that I think that helps. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Deborah asked, in addition to offering something like an ebook and an email to exchange for email addresses, can you suggest other ways to increase our database and contacts? Our peer our peer group is uh, too small and not local, so we cannot be used. Um, we need to, so they're basically just asking about brand awareness and other ways to gain email addresses besides ebooks and white papers and whatnot. <laughs> Network yeah. events. Yeah. yeah, you can do virtual programs. You yeah. can do newsletters. You can do virtual meetups. You can do a webinar of what we're doing right now. You can do um, put pop-ups on pop your website, asking yeah. people to subscribe to your emails if they want to hear from you. Um, I think we got this question a lot, which is like, how do I, I don't even have a, an email list. How do I get started? Then there's probably a lot of you in the same position. Um, consider putting, you know, a tiny bit of advertising spend behind some of the content that you're developing and housing on your website. Like it's, you'll start small and then that brand awareness in the world, the word will start to spread. And also, if you have a group of staff, if you have volunteers, if you have anybody that you know that has supported your cause, networking within your circle is the number one way that nonprofits can expand their network. That's what happened for a lot of nonprofits that were very grassroots, where one person either had a health issue or an issue where their child did, and they got their friends and family to rally around them. And that is what started the organization to grow and grow and grow. It's a really powerful way to begin your nonprofit journey. I think that's all the time we have right now. So, so we had so many questions, sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but um, 
perfect. Uh, sorry, one second here. Uh, sorry. All right, everyone. So uh, that concludes today's session. Thank you, Brian and Meredith, so much. And before I go, I just want to let everyone know there's going to be a very short survey at the end that will pop up. It only takes about 20 seconds, so we greatly appreciate hearing your feedback on the session. So I hope you fill that out. Um, we have our next webinar coming out on Tuesday, August 22nd, called Donor Advised Funds, DAFs, and what your organization needs to know. Um, and, I've, and I'll include the link in the chat right now. So thanks again, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you all at the next webinar. And the recording will be sent out. Yes. Receive it in your email. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs>